Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we have a really disturbing video for you. Murder attempts. It does not come lightly as you can imagine. Massive trigger warning to anyone who might be sensitive to these kind of things because things are going to get very graphic and extremely disturbing. You have been warned. Also to anyone who still wants to try out our app before it goes live for everyone, you can find a link in the description. Well, if you're interested, let me know what you think, but for now it's time to get comfortable. Hold on to your blankets and let the darkness take control. I have a schizophrenic brother who started an argument when we were in our late teens over my dad giving me his old iPhone. He decided a rational tactic was to chase me with a chainsaw, then try to chainsaw my car. The police came, but not before he broke my mother's ribs. I have had an intervention order against him since, and no longer consider him family. My wife went to university with a woman who had a big, jagged scar on her throat, and one day, she told her how she got it. Some guy followed her when she left school, grabbed her from behind, cut her throat, and raped her. She woke up in the middle of the attack and got her thumb into his mouth and ripped his cheek open, gave him a full-on joker scar on one side, which distracted him enough for her to get away. The idiot misogynistic judge gave the guy a reduced sentence because she was unconscious during most of the rape, so didn't suffer as much. I despise judges who give lenient sentences to rapists and other violent men. I chatted to my wife about this, and she also mentioned that he originally got six years, but she and her family appealed the leniency of the sentence and got it increased to seven. Some justice was at least served. I worked at a small family-owned bicycle shop. My boss, the father of the family, was a pretty nice guy, as far as I knew him anyway. One day I was rearranging displays and my boss's wife and kids were there. It was a pretty normal day until someone slammed the shop door open and emptied a full pistol clip into the shop, specifically at my boss. I got one in the stomach as soon as I knew what was happening and I waited until I heard the guy run away. My boss was shot a few times in the head and chest and was obviously dead on the spot. His daughter got hit in the upper arm and the wife broke her arm diving to the floor. It happened in Iloilo, Philippines around 2015. Apparently, it was about my boss not paying money he owed to the guy that murdered him. And I still don't know if they ever caught him. This isn't my story, but my cousin's. She was married to a crazy man. I won't go into the detail about the way he was, but it was awful. He was insane. Also, before he married my cousin, he had another family who all died in a house fire. All four of his children and his previous wife. We all felt bad for him for suffering such a tragic loss because we didn't know what he was like behind the scenes at home. We never suspected anything off about that, just thought it was a tragedy. Well, finally my cousin decided to leave him. She took her two kids and moved away. She had to leave abruptly, so she was missing a lot of important things. Social security cards, birth certificates and stuff like that. One day after things cooled down between her and her ex, she arranged for her to go over to their old house and gather the rest of their things. He asked them to bring the kids because he missed them. Luckily, she decided to let them stay at their friend's house instead. She went over to the house and he was absolutely enraged he didn't bring the kids. He shot my cousin four times and then shot himself in the head. He was planning to do a murder-suicide with the whole family. That's why he wanted the kids there. My cousin was shot twice in the neck and in the face and arm. 
Somehow, none of the bullets struck any major arteries or anything, and she was able to make it to the next door neighbor's house to get help. She survived the murder-suicide attempt, and her ex didn't. The whole thing really makes me look at that house fire tragedy a little differently. This is a story that my cousin shared. He had joined the army and was stationed as a craftsman, basically a private in the engineering division, and he had signed up as a mechanic for an apprenticeship. They were sent to Thailand for some kind of training and had a weekend off. Naturally, they went and got absolutely smashed at the bar. The night was over and they were walking back to their accommodation along the beach when a Thai man walked up to them and pulled a gun. He was attempting to rob them. In my cousin's words, had he not been so absolutely hammered, he would have just given him his wallet and walked away. Instead, his drunken ass wrestled the gun out of his hand and just yeeted it into the ocean. Then he shoved the dude onto the sand and laughed before walking back to the accommodation, realizing how absolutely idiotic he had been the next day. I mean, he was savage and incredibly lucky, but there's a very good chance he could have ended up dead and forgotten on a beach somewhere there. I had this neighbor kid I used to play with, a complete psycho. I was four or five, and he was a year or two older than me. One day he convinced me to walk well beyond the distance that my parents allowed me without an adult. He wanted to show me something, he said. We arrive at a small lake. He pointed at the water and said, Look, there's tadpoles in there. Let's catch some. We don't have a net. You have to jump in and catch them with your hands. I told him I couldn't swim, but he insisted. He told me he pulled me up if I were drowning. I refused, and he kept trying to convince me, but eventually gave up said I was a coward. A friend of my mum saw us on our way back, and my mum wasn't very happy about the situation when she found out. Eleven years later, I transferred schools and ended up in the same class as him. I figured my childhood memory of him was exaggerated. We spoke about the childhood memories. He told me how one of our neighbours, who was a cop, had screamed at him for no reason because he was playing with a cat. Remember this. I told him it was nice to see he had so many friends. He responds, Friends? They're not my friends, they're kids. I only let them think I'm their friend. I smiled the whole time and figured he was joking. I later told my mum about having met him and she went quiet. I told her that he seemed to have turned out all right and said nothing more. A couple of weeks later, I brought it up again. She said, As a mother, I'm never able to trust that boy and you shouldn't either. She went on to tell me how I was unable to sleep and cried a lot at night when I was a young kid. Reason being that he had told me he was planning on burning down our house and murdering me and our family in our sleep. And about our neighbors screaming at him. Turns out he was actually torturing the poor cat. After that, I avoided him. Thinking back, his behavior was off even as a young adult. He was clearly manipulative and lacked empathy. I'm pretty sure he wanted to drown me that day and wanted to make it seem like it was an accident. Many of the things he did are the telltale signs of a young serial killer. I was in Nice, France during the terrorist attack and the truck drove past me within meters of where I was standing. At first, I thought it was an accident and brake failure until the police started shouting and there were severely injured and dead people in front of me and bullets popping off. I tried to help a guy who was badly injured, but he died when we pressed on his wounds. Then a policeman showed up and screamed at us to run, so we ran back as far as we could. It was a surreal and devastating night, and I still have PTSD from it. This happened during my first year in uni. I lived with three roommates at a dorm. A few months into the first semester, one of my roommates had a mental breakdown and attempted to strangle me while I was asleep. I awoke to his hands around my throat, his knee on my chest, and a deranged look on his face. 
I tried to push him off me, clawed at his face but to no avail. My eyes started to dim, my hands felt leaden, and I was sure I was going to die. Fortunately, my other roommate wasn't asleep. He was laying under the covers browsing on his phone. The sound from our struggle caught his attention, and after seeing what was happening, he pushed the attacker off me and knocked him to the ground. He then woke up the other roommate, and together they restrained the attacker on his bed and called the university police. They arrived in around 15 minutes, and after we told them what happened, they called the actual cops. My roommate was arrested and taken to a police station. There, he had another breakdown and bit one of the cops. He was transferred to a psychiatric facility after that, and of course, expelled from university. This happened to my mum. A man entered her house just before lunchtime and stabbed her and the maid multiple times. He also kept punching both of them while stabbing them. Eventually he got tired and left. My mum played dead, and then, when she was sure that they were alone, she checked on the maid to see if she was still alive. Both of them survived the attack, but the police never found the guy. The thing is, my mum knows the guy. See, she owns a flower shop and had two people working for her. One of them is a nice gay guy, and that guy had a boyfriend. It is the boyfriend who attacked my mum, and my mum told me that he was high and looking for money. It seemed like his boyfriend didn't want to give him money that day, so he decided to attack his boyfriend's employer instead. Since then, my vibrant, outgoing mother became a recluse, and she developed serious health conditions. She is also always in a state of pain, which led to her becoming dependent on pain meds. The meds ruined her livers and kidney, and now she is undergoing dialysis for it. All because some stupid idiot couldn't stand not having a little bit of money for the day instead of going out and earning it. I'll never forgive that guy. My mum was incredibly abusive to me, and on one occasion when I was around 12, she came into my room while I was sleeping. She crept over my bed and looked down upon me. I hadn't been stirring. That is when I felt something pierce my chest. She stabbed me with a kitchen knife, puncturing my lung, which I didn't know at the time. Obviously, this woke me up. I just rolled out of bed and ran around the house screaming. Someone on our road noticed and called the police because of the noise. Just before the police arrived, she started choking me and I lost consciousness. I later woke up in the hospital and mostly recovered. She is now in jail. This is not the only time that she tried, but it was the most dramatic and the only time she came this close to actually ending my life. If the neighbor hadn't have called the cops, I don't think I would have been able to tell you this story today. There was a girl in the village of my parents' vacation home who was known to have mental health issues. My family never judged her for it. Both my parents are teachers and used to deal with slow students that say some wicked things every now and then. When I was two, my parents went on vacation and so did that girl's family. The girl was 12. Both families were having lunch together and my parents left the girl to play with me. When my sister, nine at the time, went to look for me, I was being drowned in a water tank by said girl, who was just looking at my sister smiling, saying some weird things. My sister screamed and my parents and the girl's family went to the rescue in just enough time to save my life. I have no memory of this, so all I know of the story is from what my family told me many times. I haven't actually ever met this girl, neither have I ever talked to her family. Both families still go on vacation to the same village at the same time, but my parents cut ties with them completely after this. When I was a kid, 
my father got into a relationship with a rather strange but still kind woman. She had a son who was only a few years older than me. At the time, I didn't really think anything of their relationship, but looking back at it, it was very abusive. They got into fights often, most of them turning physical, even when both me and my father were present. The kid would always try to push me over and hit me, but I would never say anything to my father because I didn't want to ruin his relationship. Now, here is where my memory gets a little hazy. My father and his then girlfriend were having a conversation, while I and her son were a few meters away from them. He once again tried to hit me, at which I sat on top of him to prevent that, as I was a really fat kid and he was very skinny, so despite the age difference, this somehow worked. I told him I would let him up if he left me alone, and since he promised to do so, I just sat beside him. He proceeded to get on top of me and strangle me. I remember trying to cry out for help and reaching out to my father, but not being able to make a single sound and feeling like I was being pulled away from him. I'm pretty sure I passed out after that, or at least was very close to it, because after that, the only thing I remember is that my father's girlfriend and her son were now gone. I never saw them again, though the last I heard of them was from years later, after my dad received an anti-wedding invitation from her. From what my dad told me, she was angry at her son, but even more pissed at my dad for ending the relationship. I'm pretty sure he didn't really intend to murder me, I hope. But then again, what was the intention of trying to strangle a seven to eight year old kid? All in all, this was surprisingly less traumatic than you think it should have been. My neighbors heard me and my live-in perpetrator arguing and struggling while I was being pinned against the wall and strangled. So my neighbor, being the diligent man he was, called the cops. They came over, but the perpetrator sweet talked them into thinking it was a misunderstanding and that it was all over. They left. But one cop had a bad feeling, bless his heart, he told me afterwards, and he waited outside. My perpetrator came at me dragging a life along the wall, which made a creepy horror movie metallic sound, and I screamed. It was at that very moment the cop broke down the door and saved me and arrested the perpetrator. He spent three months in a psychiatric facility because they admitted to wanting to hurt me some more. Obviously, the perpetrator was my then partner. And I'm glad that relationship is over. This didn't happen to me but my sister. She was working in a retail sales job at a large and popular mall in a city a few years back. One day, she arrived at the mall for work, like any other day. She stopped and went to use the restroom, the ones general mall goers would use. After using the restroom, she went to wash her hands when she noticed in the mirror that a man was standing behind her. She made eye contact with him and apparently gave him a nod of acknowledgement. The man was apparently holding a garbage bag. He had gotten out of the restroom trash can and had fashioned it like a rope. He then proceeded to approach my sister and wrapped it around her neck, choking her and slamming her to the ground. She doesn't remember much, but the security camera showed the man literally choking her unconscious and then just jump and stomp on her head repeatedly. The man fled, and she was found by another mall goer, covered in blood, her face badly disfigured. She broke her jaw, lost several teeth. Long-term brain damage is still not known. He tried to kill her. He was a complete stranger, but the police think it was a gang initiation type of thing. The guy is now in jail, and will be for a very long time. And my sister has extremely severe PTSD from it.
A while back, I was at my friend's house when a guy came in through the balcony glass door. He had to have climbed up two stories of balcony just to make it, and proceeded to start yelling things at her like, Who is this guy? And I stood up and protected her. It was dark and I couldn't see the knife in his hand, which he then stabbed me with in the face. I never knew the guy, never even met him or got his name. After I was out of hospital and started to try and figure out what the hell that was about, our mutual friend told me that he had asked the perp the same question and his answer was, I'm going to murder her. But I didn't know that he was there as well. I'm 23 and this was my second time getting stabbed altogether. Five stab scars in total. Welcome to Finland. I was in Thailand, heading back to my apartment from a popular corner of the bars in Chiang Mai. I went down the same streets and alleys I always did, cutting through the centre of the city to the edge of the moat by the Ram Hospital. I passed by the technical college and saw a group of guys hanging out on the corner. I didn't think anything of it as I entered the final alley that would put me at the moat of my apartment. Two mopeds passed me and went into an alcove to my right. As I passed it, they zoomed out and cut me off. It was at that moment that four guys hopped off their bikes and one approached me. Where are you going? He asked and then punched me in the face. I stood there stunned, thinking, did he just really punch me in the face? I look up and his arm has something in it. In a swinging motion, I did the only thing I thought of at the moment and put my arms up to protect my face and I yell out. After several blows to my arms, I turn and run, but his buddies were there to stop me, cutting off my escape. After a few minutes, they hopped on their bikes and dipped. I have no clue why. Maybe it was the yelling. But I looked down at my arm. My left arm below the wrist was cut halfway through. One of the bones was completely exposed, marrow and everything. My hand hanging uselessly at the end. I knew immediately I was in deep trouble. I didn't even feel a thing. I have a minor medical training, so I took note that no arteries were severed, but I was bleeding profusely and needed help. I went to the guest house nearby and asked the attendant for help. Poor thing looked faint when she saw me. She got me in her car and took me to the RAM hospital a hundred yards away. Turns out the guy swung at me with a machete according to the doctor. I thought it was a cane or rod. So that's my story. It's important for me to say that I stayed in Thailand for about a year after this event, despite my pleas for me to get out of there and come home. I wasn't about to let that ruin my life. Anyway, I have full function of the arm and hand now. After four years of drinking to bury the memory, I'm happy to say I started therapy six months ago. I quit drinking entirely and was diagnosed with PTSD, obviously. I'm finally addressing the demon who's been hiding in the depths of my mind, and he has his days numbered. I was attacked in a friend's house by an ex-husband. He slit her throat and smashed my face with a box cutter before hitting me over the head with a plate, knocking me out temporarily. He then lit the place on fire with us in it. I managed to wake up and drag her outside and a neighbor called the police and ambulance. They caught him two days later, trying to end his life in a Ramada Inn. We both lived through it, and he is now serving a life sentence. When I was living overseas, a man broke into my apartment. He came through the window of my studio apartment about 5 to 5.30 in the morning. Thankfully, I was awake, he started to go attack me and strangle me, and I was able to fight him off, getting up to my feet onto his chest and pushing with all my strength. This happened a few times. The only thing that he would say is, you die, repeatedly. He was slender, and I don't think he was very prepared. 
and I didn't think he would have expected me to fight back. Partway through this, when I realized that he wasn't giving up, is when I really started to get scared and think to myself that I needed a plan to get out of there. My friend lived next door, so I decided I was going to make a run for it. Once I stood up, he backed out of the window. I grabbed my glasses and my phone and ran to my friend's apartment. Thankfully, she was awake. I told her what happened and she was like, you have to call the police. By this time, shock was starting to set in for some reason and my brain was yelling, okay, so nothing happened here, I'm fine. But she kept reiterating I needed to call them. So, I decided to call one of my co-workers who spoke English really well and ask her. The co-worker was horrified at what happened and called immediately and said that she was going to call the police for me and call me back. Once the police arrived, she acted as a translator to tell them exactly what happened. But I really hope he never tried that again. This happened to me when I was a young Girl Scout, probably around six or seven in the early 2000s. My group and I were going door to door to sell cookies, and we were all walking in groups of two to go up to different houses, with the adult leader at the very back of the line. My partner and I went to a house with a woman who answered. She was probably in her 50s and wearing a long, old-fashioned nightgown. We asked if she wanted cookies, and she said yes, but that she would have to grab her wallet. She asked if we wanted to take a step inside while she went to get it, and we said that would be fine. The adult leader was nowhere around at this point. I assumed she was lagging behind with some of the other girls. Then she said something along the lines of, Oh, I have some cats in the basement. Do you like kitties? Do you want to see the kitties? And I love cats. Even to this day, 20 years later, they're still my favorite animal. So I begin to take some steps towards the basement door, which was open, and I see the dark steps going down. Just as I'm about to take the first step down, I feel a hand yank back at the coat that I was wearing around the neck area. It was the adult leader of the group. She was yelling at the woman as she pulls me and the other Girl Scouts out the house. I'm not sure if I would have been murdered that day. I have a brief memory of the woman apologizing profusely, saying stuff like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't even consider that. But after reading many true crime books and consuming content like this, I know now how unsafe it actually was to go door to door selling cookies. It makes me pause and think about how badly that could have turned out for me. I was around seven years old, and I'm a boy, when I made friends with a neighbor girl, and we would frequently play together. She had an older brother that was around 12 to 13 who would babysit us during these hangouts. One day my parents let me go over to their place on my own, as their house was in spitting distance of ours, but the brother was the only one home. He assured me that his sister would be home soon, so he lured me out to the backyard. The background, the house was completely fenced in, and all backyard had a tree line surrounding it. He told me to wait by the swings, which I did, and all of a sudden he charged at me with a sledgehammer. I fell in on my back in fear, and his swing landed between my legs into the ground. I ran as fast as I could to my house. My parents, to this day, say it was just horseplay, but I'll never forget the look in his eyes after he missed that swing. I went on a third date with a guy I met online. Everything up to this point seemed totally normal. We had talked for months before actually meeting due to the pandemic, so at this point I'd almost known him for six months. After the date, I invited him over, and honestly my intention was to sleep with him that night, but once we got upstairs I just wasn't feeling it, and told him I wanted to wait. He agreed and said he thought he should go. I walked him to the door, but when I turned around he pushed me up against the wall and started being really rough. I thought he was joking until he pulled me to the ground and pinned me. Once I realized what was going on, I started and struggled like hell. 
His eyes turned black, and I could tell he was enjoying seeing me scared. So I tried negotiating, begging, crying, and fighting. He was like a robot on autopilot. At that point, to stop me from struggling, he just started to hit me as hard as he could in the face and head. And I played dead until he stopped. He was so turned on by this act, and it took a split second for him to just get up and leave me there thinking I was either unconscious or dead. I reported it. They got DNA, but he was never caught. Turned out everything he told me about himself was fake, and his phone was a burner. To this day, I have no idea who he is or if he'll ever come back to hurt me again. I just had bought a condo, so I didn't want to move, but seriously considered it. Luckily, the building was already in the midst of having more security cameras and additional security measures installed. I got an alarm system, even though my floor is elevator locked and needs a fob to access, but you can never be too careful. Ladies, please be careful while online dating. I guess the moral of the story is make sure you really know someone before being alone with them. Ask for ID, Google them, check their names and details add up, do a criminal record search, and don't be afraid to ask. It's not rude or weird. It's better to be safe than dead. I was in a club with a girl who I think was called Caroline. And since I'm not sure, and it was 28 years ago, I will continue to refer to her as Caroline. It was going well, except that I was very drunk. And when we were outside to spend some time together, I sat in a bench and puked. She sat with me a while and wanted to walk me home, but I do not handle vomiting very well. And it was her night with lots of friends in the club. So I insisted she go back in and I walk it off back home. As we separated, a man came from the shadows with a knife, the sort of knife that has no real use apart from stabbing people. It turns out the club Browns had a gay night on a Thursday and he was out to murder a homosexual. It was the very early nineties and queer bashing was sadly still a thing. He was very clear in outlining his plan and explained to me why he was going to do it. And in my drunken state, I tried to argue that the club was not a gay club and I was not gay. Anyway, look, I had been there with Caroline. He was having none of it and he worked himself up to this and was visibly shaking with anxious excitement. He was going to knife me in the face because I was giving money to a club that supported homosexuality. Also, I was English, which in his nationalist Scottish mind was absolute proof that I was a homosexual. I argued that I was leaving the awful place, walking away, so I was the good guy, not my finest hour. Why not worry about Caroline instead, since she was going back in there with more cash? I was very, very drunk, and while I fully recognized what was going on, I truly did not associate it with any fear of the outcome. It was like watching a scene in a video game. Anyway, this chap asked me which one was Caroline, and I said, here, give me the knife, I'll do it. And he did, and I threw it on the roof and walked home. In the morning, I remembered it, but was not even sure if it had really happened. But that night, I met up with everyone, and I was some sort of hero, although I really was not. I was an idiot. The highlight in this storytelling was that I had thrown the knife right up into the gutter. It was a pitched roof. Lobbing a knife onto it was not a reliable method of disposing of it, so it should have just come right back down. And then I walked away very calmly. In reality, I turned the way I had thrown the knife, felt a bit sick about it, forgot all about the chap who was going to stab me with it. His decision upon losing the knife was to wander quietly away, saved me much more than any of my own actions, some which appear incredibly cowardly in the light of day. I was working in an ice cream slash fast food slash grocery store when I was 18, wearing headphones and doing dishes when a ragged middle-aged man caught my attention. 
He was enraged from a high speed wreck and he had come into the front of the stall. Carrying a broom and a knife, he had grabbed while in the restaurant. He caught me off guard and wrapped his arms around my neck and dragged me to where the whole lobby can see and shouts, this boy's gonna die tonight. An off duty cop happened to be in the lobby and begins somehow trying to negotiate or something while women are screaming and running. The man dragged to the back of the store in a corner where he forces me to lay directly on top of his body and shouts demands at the cop. He told me to scream out for help. He half ass fish hooked me, fake eye gouged me and smeared his blood all over my face. Eventually I see a SWAT team show up and they're peeking through the shelves with big guns. For a brief moment, my captor had to rearrange his grip on the knife, so I took a risk and disarmed him with a quick hand twist and slid away between a nearby officer's leg. He was shot three times immediately, and I ran outside. The whole thing lasted between 35 to 45 minutes. I always felt that this incident had a bit of a suicide by police angle, because the man didn't even cut me. He fake eye gouged me and fake fish hooked me, all to look threatening and dangerous even with guns aimed at him. And in my heart, I felt somewhat sympathetic. He seemed so desperate. Also a police violence angle. Ultimately, I disarmed the man fully and escaped before he was shot. And also the particular officer that pulled the trigger had shot a dog in the past. The whole thing started in a different county and the police allowed the high-speed chase to cross county lines before he eventually had a high-speed wreck in front of the ice cream store. This happened to a friend of mine. She went to university with me, and she always seemed relatively level-headed. But then she got into the escort scene, and her behaviour started to act up. She was making loads of money, and instead of paying off her uni debt, like I said she should, she began splashing out on loads of stuff. But she was relatively young, so I kind of get it. Anyway, one day she tells me that she's agreed to meet this guy as an escort. You know, go out with him a few hours. And that she might meet us at the clubs later, but that she'll tell me how it goes. I don't hear from her that night, and come home and don't think anything more of it. The next day, she's not at uni. She wasn't around campus, but I didn't find that particularly odd. It's not until the news hits, and I see her face on the news. Turns out the guy who she had been escorting with had taken her to his apartment. She had gone all the way up, and something or other had happened, and she ended up squeezing herself out of a narrow window 30 stories up and plummeting to her death. After a while, two people were charged with murder. It was a couple in around their 30s. The police suspected that the man had escorted my friend and then his girlfriend or partner or whatever had showed up and was angry. Something or other happened and maybe they murdered her but wanted to cover it up and so threw her body out the window. The thing that never adds up though, is that the window, according to the police report, was really small. She would have had to have dived in head first and then squeeze and squeeze her body really hard, like she wanted to kill herself. So if someone wanted to stop her, they could have easily pulled her out. No, I think these people must have done something and they wanted to get rid of her quickly. So when they were done doing what they needed to do, they just threw her out the window and called it suicide. I don't believe they were ever charged and it always pisses me off. My friend is gone. Be careful what you do out there, girls. My friend's dad used to run a bodega somewhere in South America. He never did tell me where, but the events that happened disturbed me no end. One day his dad was just in the shop minding his own business. It was around 10 o'clock at night and he was just getting ready to close up shop 
and go have his dinner with his wife. The house was connected to the shop. And just as he's about to do a few errands and tidy up before closing, a young man of about 23 busts into the shop. He immediately pulls a gun on this guy's dad and tells him that he wants all the money in the register. The dad laughs and says that he has very little today and that he's wasting his time. But this kid doesn't take no for an answer or a joke and immediately unloads his weapon into my dad's friend. Suffice to say, he didn't make it. The kid makes off with a couple of dollars worth of stuff and is caught two days later. He was sentenced to a long time in prison for his actions and I don't know if he's out yet. My friend was very young when this happened, so he never really knew his dad. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, be sure to let me know in the regular way. I know tonight's stories were a lot darker than usual, so, you know, let me know what you thought. Um, if you like this kind of content, perhaps I can make a few more. It was quite challenging to source these stories, but it was a lot of fun to make. If you have a story you wish to share, you can send it to my email address or post it in my Reddit page. Both can be found in the description. I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to my members and patrons for all their help and support in creating these videos. Thanks, guys. Anyway, for now, I think it's time for me to sign off. Why not watch one of my other videos that you can find on screen now? Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.